If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. I think calling Deacon St. John a little rough around the edges would be accurate. Hailing from the West, from a town called Farewell in Oregon, Deacon grew up without a lot of guidance or structure. His father wasn't the type to sugarcoat a life lesson, like when Deacon was young, and his father taught him that the best way to get rid of a rat's nest was to cover it and drown whatever was inside. Tough thing for a kid to watch. When Deacon became a young man, he enlisted in the army, one full tour of Afghanistan in the 10th Mountain Division. And Deacon served with honor. He had structure, learned to work with others. He was a part of a unit, a cog in a greater machine. Though he claimed to have hated every moment of his service, Deacon proved to be a man of character and strength. Near the end of his first tour, something awful happened. Deacon's squad of nine was deployed to Mazar-e-Sharif, a city in Afghanistan. En route, Taliban forces opened fire on their Humvee. It was an attack that ended with the Humvee torn to shreds and submerged in the Hari River. Deacon got out of the Humvee and began to search for survivors, his brothers in service. He found one body. He pulled them from the river and returned to his search, then another body, and another until eight bodies lay at the riverside. Deacon was the only one to make it out, and I don't think I need to spell out what that can do to a young mind. In fact, I don't think I could. The trauma, the pain, the PTSD, my words will always fall short. Deacon did not re-enlist after this tour. But as a grown man, and now out on his own in the world, Deacon gravitated towards something with structure. He landed back in Farewell, Oregon, working as a mechanic in a motorcycle shop, owned by an older man named Jack. And old Jack just so happened to be the head figure of a biker chapter in that part of Oregon called the Mongrels Motorcycle Club. And this was a seamless transition for Deacon, once the invitation was extended, to fall back into a militaristic line of command. For someone with his youth, his energy, his trauma, and his aloneness, this was arguably a godsend for the young Deacon. It may seem odd from the outside, these grown men filing rank, wearing uniforms, referring to each other by titles, but it's not for us. It was structure, support, tenants, and values, even if those sometimes went against the law and crossed moral lines. It was a life that suited Deacon. A part of the mongrels was another fellow named William Boozer Gray. And it's easy to take a look at Boozer and kind of be put on guard, isn't it? When Boozer was a kid, his father taught him how to track wild game and hunt. He spent summers working on his uncle's cattle farm, raising dirt bikes, developing a love for riding. He had a girl that he was sweet on named Joni that he eventually married. And when Boozer was a little older, he was brought in to the Mongrel Motorcycle Club by Old Jack. He eventually became a high-ranking member of that chapter of the Mongrels, serving right beside Jack. And when Deacon St. John arrived, Boozer and Deacon became fast friends, best friends, two weird peas in a pod. The duo became so close that they referred to one another as brother. But tragedy befell Boozer. His wife was killed in a biking accident and Boozer just absolutely fell apart. He began drinking himself into suicide. Deacon found Boozer the night Joni died in the throes of a wild binge, as though he wanted this to be the night that he would not wake up from. But Boozer was Deacon's brother. He wouldn't let him do this, at least not alone. Deacon downed the contents of a whiskey bottle and told Boozer that if he was going to kill himself with a drink, then Deacon was going to do it too because that's what brothers do. He would join him in his final ride. Well, Boozer had to stop. He had to stop what he was doing for Deacon. It wasn't just his own well-being on the line anymore. Boozer began sobering up and writing again, but the grief of losing his Joni, it never left. He had the mongrels, he had Deacon, and it was just enough to pull him through. But don't think that this was a group of well-meaning, heart-of-gold, gallivanting gentlemen intent on preserving all that's wondrous and pure within the world. They dealt in drugs, had turf wars, assaulted competitors in their weed-growing business, and regularly had to dodge run-ins with the law. They were rough and tumble, even against their own, should rules be broken. For example, a young buck within the Mongrel Motorcycle Club called Jesse Williamson did something unforgivable. He killed another member of the Mongrels. And this wasn't something that could just be covered up or forgotten. It was unforgivable. Jesse Williamson was brought in and stripped of his rank within the Mongrels MC. 
he had to go, except he had a massive tattoo on his back of the club's emblem. It had to go. Deacon and Boozer held Jesse Williamson down as old Jack used a blowtorch to burn the tattoo off his back before sending him off into the world to suffer his wound and start over. But for a moment, moving on to another story that will soon intertwine with Deacon St. John's. A research facility was established at Iron Butte, a place called Cloverdale. A state-of-the-art, high-tech facility occupied by a number of researchers studying the plant life around the area. It just so happened that a rare mutation of lavender grew in the area, making it the perfect reason to plant the facility there, in the mountains, away from civilization and prying eyes. Cloverdale was protected with on-site security and a system called ARI, standing for Artificial Intelligence Response Interface. There was a nuclear-powered generator on site and solar arrays on the rooftop to ensure that the power never went down. All of this to study some flowers, hmm? Well, one of the young researchers recruited to work here was a woman named Sarah Irene Whitaker. And Sarah would argue to you that this was just big pharma money trying to turn a few extra billions in their favor. High stakes in the world of pharmaceuticals. Some on-site faculty believed this mutation of lavender, for example, could be synthesized into a new way to treat burns. And lovely Sarah Irene Whitaker encountered our outlaw rogue Deacon St. John by happenstance on a backcountry road where her vehicle broke down en route to work one day. And the two had obvious chemistry despite being very different personalities. Their characters complemented one another. Deacon St. John proved to be a bit of a romantic, Sarah more rough around the edges than you might expect. And as these things sometimes go, the two fell in love, a heart-touching affair, a beautiful wedding. But anyways, for what's to come, it's important to remember that Sarah Irene Whitaker was devastatingly important and beloved by Deacon St. John and by Boozer, who called her his little sister. Boozer, who was also the only person to attend their wedding. Sarah made familial sacrifices to be with Deacon, an accomplished researcher with two PhDs marrying a biker gang bad boy. Mom and Dad certainly would not approve, and Deacon even took the title of Nomad within the Mongrel Motorcycle Club, signifying that, while still loyal to and a part of the club, he would not be actively riding with them anymore. His devotions switched to Sarah, not a thrilling prospect to the members of the club, I'm sure, but Deacon is a stubborn guy. He gave up time with them to be with his new wife, to start a new life. Everything was really coming together for Deacon and Sarah, hmm? A lovely, beautiful, newlywed couple. But let's return to Cloverdale Research Institute and the work taking place there by Sarah Irene Whitaker and her colleagues. Everyone with their specializations, growing their plant life, collecting their data, running experiments. But you know, there was this intern that just, he thought it smelled a little funky a fellow named David Gorman. And young David Gorman told Sarah Whitaker that he thought a great conspiracy was at play here. Things didn't quite add up for him and Sarah thought that he was just being paranoid. She didn't believe a word that he said. And then clearance revokes began. The Cloverdale researchers were denied access to their clean room and communications from company higher ups all but ceased. So in secret, research intern David Gorman took matters into his own hands. He hacked through a firewall, downloaded classified information related to the studies taking place at Cloverdale, and then he broke into the lockdown lab and took samples of something being grown there. But the intern did not abide by clean room standards when removing the samples and infected himself with whatever was in those test tubes. He didn't get ill right away, no. David Gorman took the samples to Portland, Oregon, where a green expo was taking place, probably to meet with a reporter and act as a whistleblower. And the infected David Gorman began spreading the airborne affliction. Within two days, it would have spread to an unknowable number of people within that convention, who then got on their planes home and continued to spread it. And this early version of the virus, it had an incubation period of about a week. And once that virus came alive, the world fell apart. The virus killed nearly all children under the age of 12 and adults over the age of 60 when infected. Their immune systems just couldn't handle what was happening. But not all in those age groups died. More on that later. But what did this virus do? Well, 
It spreads through the lymphatic system. It shuts down or destroys the parts of the human brain that control higher mental functions like judgment and inhibition, as well as most memory associations, written and spoken word comprehension, self-identity and recognition. It makes the brain primal and devoid of rational thought. What makes us uniquely human goes right out the window. The virus doesn't work like viruses as we know them now, not even like cancer. It doesn't impair organ function, manically reproduce, or cause mass cell death. By activating typically dormant proto-oncogenes, or proteins that stimulate cell division, this virus reprograms the body to prompt intense muscle growth. Fight responses override any potentially remaining rational thought, causing immense physical and mental mutations to commence in a very short amount of time. The young and the aged die en masse because of this extremely rapid physical change. Typically, their bodies just can't handle it, though there are some that do. When cases first began to present, it was the National Emergency Response Organization, or NERO, that spearheaded initial containment. Portland was ground zero, the hardest hit of American major cities. But by the grace of spread out population centers and difficult terrain, it was not the Pacific Northwest that fell first. Everything east of the Mississippi was overrun. The entirety of the East Coast was lost within just the first week of chaos. Nero took control of military deployments and directives. There was no one else with the apparent know-how to handle the situation. The government crumbled. Nero efforts within Oregon and conditions along the West Coast have been documented as Nero held major facilities and ground offices in the Pacific Northwest, but the rest of the world just had to fend for themselves. Godspeed and good luck to you all. In Oregon, major city centers attempted to evacuate as infections spread. But it was like trying to stop wildfire with a water gun. Within Oregon, Nero set up refugee camps, checkpoints along highways to keep infection out, and controlled the extreme amount of civilians trying to reach safety. But what this meant in practice was that those who didn't die in the city centers, meaning a very small percentage of people, met their doom trapped on highways when the infected, violent hordes began to move up the major roads. These roadblocks would stretch back for miles, and every minute of every hour, more infections presented in those who had been exposed in the days prior. Checkpoints and camps were overrun en masse by panicking civilians and hordes of infected breaking through the lines of fire. There just hadn't been enough time to set up viable defenses, no walls, no weaponry. Tunnels, sandbags, and traffic kept people in order, but once the infected arrived and panic began, there was nothing there to stop it. And it didn't take long for the order to come down. Nero personnel were directed to abandon the camps and the roads with no warning to the civilians on the ground. Those who argued with the order or who refused to leave generally met with very gruesome ends. There was no containment to be had, no salvation to be carried out. Safe zones became myths for those who weren't wearing a Nero uniform. Even then, it was far from a guarantee that you could be kept safe from the outside world. Two and a half billion people were estimated dead within the first week. So, hell came to Earth, but we can't tarry on stories from the world. In actuality, who knows what became of the lands beyond America? Let's rewind a few days to the sudden outbreak of the virus and focus on one man's story, though it will involve many moving parts. The virus, of course, came to Farewell, Oregon, the home of the newly wedded Deacon St. John and Sarah Irene Whitaker, as well as William Boozer Gray. The night everything imploded at Farewell, when the virus flooded the streets, Sarah convinced Deacon, and by extension, Boozer, to take her into the Cloverdale office in town to search for information about that young research intern, David Gorman, only for her to discover that he had been missing for two weeks. Suspicions began to form, given the news of a viral outbreak causing chaos very suddenly across the states, but Sarah had minutes to mull this information over before the outbreak began. It happened so incredibly fast. Deacon had told her that they needed to stay away from the towns just in case, but no one thought that it would be something like that and that it could happen so quickly. They got caught in the middle of farewell. Nero troops and employees were taken down in the streets. They would have to fight their own way out. 
A moment of concern took Sarah when she saw a young girl crying in a corner. She couldn't have known that the girl was infected and already in a state of losing control of her senses. The girl shivved Sarah in the gut, and not the Hollywood kind of stab that the lead character could just heroically shake off and carry on with as though it were nothing. Internal bleeding began. An organ was nicked. Sarah was able to carry on for a while, but each step became more difficult, and it was clear that Sarah was not going to be able to walk out of farewell. Deacon feared that she was turning septic. A Nero evac was still on a rooftop, and Deacon set his eyes on getting them into it, except the young grad student named O'Brien overseeing the helicopter insisted that only two of the three could go. The copter was already overweight. It was dangerous to even just take two of them, and the only reason he even agreed to that was the gun Deacon put in his face. Boozer was already mildly injured, and there was no way that Boozer would leave Deacon on that rooftop, and there was no way that Deacon would leave him behind either. Sarah was sent away in the safety of that Nero helicopter, leaving Deacon and Boozer behind. The young grad student called O'Brien kept Sarah alive until she could be taken into surgery at a Nero refugee camp. And Deacon and Boozer fought their way out of farewell, beginning their search for where Sarah was taken, a place called Three-Fingered Jack. But what they found was a very common tragedy. It was overrun, a field of corpses and infected. It wasn't apparent if anyone had made it out before this horror had happened. Deacon and Boozer killed everything in that camp and scanned hundreds of dead faces trying to find Sarah, but they couldn't find her. Sometimes it was hard to tell what they were even looking at. So of, of course she was dead. No one could have made it out of this alive. Colloquially, those infected became known as freakers, the freaker virus. It also infected domesticated animals and wildlife, dogs, bears, wolves, bats, ravens. And there were subspecies, I suppose you would say, of those infected, different types of freakers, such as swarmers, a common freaker type that traveled in herds or hordes, and tracks groups of other swarmers through pheromones in their waste should they lose their group. Then there are newts, children who survive their infection process. They tend to stick to rooftops or in cover with other newts, not traveling out in the open like swarmers do. And a newt won't typically pick a fight unless there's already blood in the air and their target seems vulnerable. Nasty little guys they are. Then there are screamers, females that act as bellowing alerts to a potentially dangerous presence then bleachers, who, while similar to the basic swarmer, are actually a bit more intelligent. They're more healthy, more vicious, more dangerous, but not as lethal as the breakers. Extremely mutated freakers that in life were people of already built muscle mass, weightlifters and bodybuilders, elevated testosterone and possibly steroid users. Breakers are extremely hostile towards other freakers as well, something very unusual if starvation isn't involved. There are a few more types for us to talk about, but oh my, I don't want to spoil anything too soon. Let's take our time on this one, shall we? Civilians that did survive the outbreak were generally the most hardened of society, folks that had survival skills, who knew how to vanish, who had no qualms against acting violent, who didn't seek protection from government camps or other civilian groups. Sure, there were some who got lucky and bunkered down, or who homesteaded and just missed the hordes of infected, but in terms of longevity, it was the hardened who made it the longest. As groups of survivors began to find one another, it was those personality types that took leadership positions over small communities, and we'll touch on a few of those as we go. For two years, Deacon and Boozer lived drifter lifestyles generally going from place to place, staying for short stints, performing jobs and bounties for different camps and outposts to earn localized credits for supplies and food. And the two have a very delicate and personal dynamic. While once it was Deacon that kept Boozer from ending his life after the death of his wife Joni, now it's Boozer who keeps Deacon from going over the edge. The two brothers share in that loss, losing their beloved, and Deacon got angry. He got reckless. He internalized his agony only for it to erupt in rage when opportunities towards violence arose. While Boozer served as a voice of reason, the two men were together very willing to behave in extremely dangerous manners. They knew that this life only ended one way, 
in violence, and it was just a matter of time. Boozer has taught Deegan the basics on how to track down game, and that now includes humans. It served the duo well to have that ability, given that bounty hunting generally involved hunting down scumbags that ripped off the wrong scum lord. On this particular beautiful overcast day, it is a man named Leon that Boozer and Deacon are chasing. Seems Leon stole drugs from the camp of Ada Tucker at the Hot Springs camp to fence to another camp leader named Mark Copeland at the Copeland camp. And while Leon beat and abandoned a cohort to die at the roadside, Deacon and Boozer do not return this treatment to Leon when they get their hands on him. Being torn apart by freaks is a terrible fate and exchanging a quick death for information is a very easy trade to make. The boys will retrieve the hidden stash of drugs and then decide what to do with it, but first, Deacon needs repair parts for his bike. A stray bullet took out his fuel line and he had to leave the bike under cover. They can get the part from an old mechanic shop that's covered in freakers, but Deacon and Boozer aren't going to let something like being torn limb from limb get between them and a new fuel pump. They are reckless, but they are also extremely capable. Two years in this mess has numbed some of those fears of these things. Except, you know, it's not just the freaks that humans need to be wary of. Other humans are just as dangerous. We tribalistic and skittish things that we are, of course we would turn on each other, even after the collapse of civilization. Seems to be a part of our default settings, so let's talk a little bit about the Rippers. R.I.P., or Rest in Peace, is a freaker-worshipping cult, human beings who trip out on PCP or whatever they can get their hands on, to cut themselves up and carve things into their skin. They couldn't handle this new world, and they desire to forget the past, to become more akin to the mindless hordes of violent freaks. And part of their mission is torturing victims into compliance with their beliefs, or just hunting people down for macabre sacrifices or rituals. Rather than just throwing themselves into a horde or seeking out infection, they bring chaos and pain to non-rippers. Some of them will give themselves over to a hungering freaker, but not enough to make a dent in their numbers. And luck is just not on Boozer's side today. As Deacon searches for a bike part, Boozer is distracted by the freakers nearby on his bike, and Boozer gets caught in a road trap by a group of rippers. Now, they don't kill him outright, no, they want to convert Boozer, apparently. So they take a blowtorch to the tattoos on his arm. Hmm, didn't Boozer and Deacon once participate in something like this a long time ago? Take a blowtorch to someone's tattoo? Huh, okay, well, you know, probably just a coincidence, right? <clears throat> Boozer's tattoos are dead symbols of a lost world and they need to be removed to purify Boozer. And Deacon is able to intervene and remove Boozer from the situation, but again, this is not Hollywood. Boozer took a blowtorch to the arm, and the damage went far deeper than skin level, and deep, exposed wounds are dangerous in the best of circumstances. They're not living the most hygienic of lifestyles. There are going to be consequences for this wound that Boozer will suffer, made even worse by the fact that Boozer doesn't want to acknowledge just how bad it is, and Deacon is not emotionally equipped to process and handle the situation. Deacon will scavenge for remedies, but bandages and ointments cannot undo third-degree burns covering most of a limb. But first things first, Deacon needs his bike. He's got the parts that he needs to repair it, and just as luck would have it, oh good, his bike is gone. Somebody found it and took off with it, and if Deacon's instincts are correct, then the weird man running up the hillside nearby just might know what the hell happened to his bike. Deacon needs his transportation. So in true Benny Hill fashion, he takes off after the man, who's very insistent that he doesn't know what happened to Deacon's bike, looks like one of Mark Copeland's boys, and he leads him up to the nearby Copeland camp. The camp mechanic Manny did not waste any time in parting out Deacon's bike. It is stripped down to the bare frame. But in Manny's defense, he didn't know that it was Deacon's and he feels pretty lousy about it, so he offers him a bare bones replacement. It's hard to stay mad at Manny, he doesn't seem like a bad dude. Deacon is just angry about the bike, it had sentimental value to him, but in his way he, he understands, there is no maliciousness from Manny. Mark Copeland, on the other hand, does seem a troublesome type. You see, Copeland is a paranoid nut job with a persecution complex. You know the type, always the victim, always right. 
a victim-blaming pile of trash, a conspiracy theorist who also happens to have a radio program that he incessantly blasts out called Radio Free Organ. And he wants Ada Tucker's drugs. Because of course everyone wants Ada Tucker's drugs, although in his defense, he does have people that need pain management too. So Deacon gets to choose who will get to have these prized narcotics. Deacon does some runs and some bounties for Copeland. He garners some good favor to brush over the whole killing Leon business. And he gets Copeland's radio tower up and running so he can continue to broadcast his radio free organ program. So good. And while Deke is at it, he begins hunting down sterile bandages and medications for Boozer, who is just getting worse and worse by the hour, yet both of these lugheads seem absolutely incapable of calling a spade a spade and conceding that Boozer needs to get into a camp for medical treatment. Deacon does find sterile bandages at an abandoned Nero checkpoint, and I'll give you two guesses as to what happened at this little slice of paradise. One hint, it wasn't positive. Deacon and Boozer have made plans to ride north leave this area once their affairs were settled, before Boozer took a blowtorch to the arm. And the two are insistent at each other that as soon as Boozer is well enough, they will take that ride, but just look at the guy. Boozer is not well, he's feverish and refuses to allow Deacon to inspect the wound. It's like they're both in a denial of the situation. But you know, there's still that whole Leon drug situation to deal with. Before Deacon put a hole in his skull, Leon confessed to burying the drugs in a nearby cemetery, not hard to find. It's right near where Leon beat his accomplice and left her body to the freaks, a very dramatic place to bury a bunch of drugs. Now, imagine how startling it would be to suddenly hear this sound after two years of not knowing what the world has become, feeling isolated and having lost everything, and a gosh dang helicopter shows up out of the blue. I would chase that thing down no matter the cost, wouldn't you? I feel like that would be a very normal reaction to have, and Deacon is no different. He rides hard after that thing, and he finds out that it's a Nero helicopter full of armed soldiers escorting a Nero scientist. They've been tracking freak hordes, studying their hibernation locations, specifically in this case, stage three evolutions, meaning these are exceptionally strong and intelligent compared to basic swarmers and there's over 400 of them hibernating in that cave. At least, according to a now Lieutenant O'Brien, do you remember him? The grad student that saved Sarah Irene Whitaker's life two years ago on that rooftop well. O'Brien didn't die that night. He made it out of that camp, so what if Sarah did too? What if Sarah is still alive? No, that's too much to hope for. It's impossible, right? Deacon can't entertain the thought of that or, or the hope, but what if... He could get in touch with O'Brien, and then maybe, maybe he could find out what happened to her, you know, you, you know how she died. Deke mentions it to Boozer, who urges him not to pursue that path, as of course it will lead to false hope, but inside, Deacon never really gave up hope that Sarah was alive somewhere. He didn't confirm her death. What if there is still a chance? Even if he cannot bring himself to say it aloud, that sentiment is going to push him farther down this path. He needs to find O'Brien. Let's take a stroll, shall we? Let's meet the camp leader that got this whole Leon Bounty drug retrieval business underway. Camp Hot Springs, the camp of Ada Tucker, who I would refer to as a righteous piece of work. Before everything went to hell, Ada Tucker oversaw the female ward of a prison, and she treats the people of this camp like her prisoners. Tucker is intent on turning this area into a farm, despite being set on lava beds that would require large machinery to dig through to reach soil. But here is where the camp is located, and so Ada Tucker will not budge in her mission, no matter how insane it is. Dig through the rocks to reach soil. The residents here are just slave labor to her, and the guards of this camp will enforce that back-breaking labor requirement placed on anyone who resides here. First impressions of Ada Tucker are not good. Her right-hand man, named Alki Turner, informs her of rippers encroaching on their territory and Ada Tucker starts casting blame and shame over him because no one stopped them. Never mind how thinly spread their security is. The rippers are the PCP-fueled cultist maniacs who like to mangle and burn people. Just what are a few men going to do against a group of them? But Ada Tucker insists on being just absolutely insufferable over it. 
Deacon can at least turn in Leon's bounty here and get camp credits for doing so. Ada Tucker can offer weapons in exchange, Copeland can offer bike parts. So in this case, in regards to the drugs, it will not be Ada Tucker who gets the supply. Tough break. Though she very much would like for Deacon to bring in more slave labor for her, she has her eye on a girl that was spotted at the small town of Marion Forks. Strange that a child could survive out on their own, but the man who spotted her was insistent that she was not a newt. Alki has some interesting news to share with Deacon, though, before he departs. See, one of his men happened to escape from a ripper camp recently and informed Alki that the ripper leader, a man named Carlos, was really interested in two bikers, men that the rippers called mongrels. Hmm, well, that's unfortunate. I wonder who this Carlos fellow is. Deacon takes the job from Ada Tucker to find the girl at Marion Forks and deliver her to the Hot Springs camp. But that involves passing through an area that Deacon has tried to avoid without much success, the old camp that Sarah was taken to that was overrun, the place that he imagines she died. He's carved out a little memorial for her there. He would sometimes go up there and take her flowers, talk to her about what was going on, how he felt, what he was thinking about doing, and the memories of this place are part of why Boozer and Deacon were intent on going north, to get away from it. But to reach Marion Forks, Deacon has to drive through that area where her memorial is, so he just, he just drops by for a moment, just to remember her. To share thoughts with the rock that he carved her name into. There's another one, just a ways up the mountain, another Nero chopper. Perfect timing. Deacon takes off after it, across rough terrain and under dark skies, but he's spotted by the Nero soldiers. They open fire, but they do not shoot to kill, rather just to warn him off and scare him away. They could have killed him, but they didn't. Not far off, the helicopter does come down, and the scientist starts trying to wrangle in what looks like a newt, like they're studying them, except there's a horde bearing down and they have to abandon the site, inconvenient for them, righteously neat for Deacon. They left behind a Nero radio, and now Deacon can track their little missions, and maybe, using this, he can find Lieutenant O'Brien. But back to Ada Tucker's little mission, there's a girl to be retrieved from Marion Forks, and, well, calling her a young woman would be more accurate. Her name is Lisa Jackson, and she appears to be between 15 and 17 years old. When the outbreak happened, Lisa's mother called her at school and told her to hurry directly home, but when Lisa arrived, the house was empty. There was a note on the fridge saying that they had gone off with some men. Lisa was abandoned. She was left behind. All she could do was hide and tell herself that her parents would be back for her any day now. And two years later, the young woman was struggling to cope with the trauma of the event and being abandoned. Deacon has to tell her a half lie to get her out of the house. Maybe, maybe her parents are at the Hot Springs camp. And well, now now that he mentions it, Lisa, Lisa just knows that, of course, her mother has to be there. Of course, it just makes sense. She has to be there. And when first taking Lisa to Ada Tucker's camp, it would seem to be a positive change. Lisa and Ada know each other from before the outbreak. They lived on the same block. Tucker even sets the girl straight on her mother's status. They both know that she is not alive. Lisa's mother and father got sick. They were taken by Nero personnel, at least... The young woman will have relative safety here. But Ada Tucker does not hide from Deacon the fact that Lisa Jackson is going straight into manual labor for the camp. Everyone has to work to earn their keep according to Ada Tucker's standards. No exceptions. But Deacon doesn't have to deal with the repercussions of this. He gets to collect his credits, buy his gear, and he leaves as he pleases. There's still the issue of Boozer, though. He's getting worse and worse, misremembering and losing his hunger. He doesn't even get out of bed when Deacon drops by. As Boozer rests, Deacon ventures out collecting bounties and gear, and then guess who decides to just bang bang into the story once again? That's right, buddy. Deacon has quickly caught O'Brien on that narrow radio that he picked up. Now, Deacon does not want to raise a stink with these people. They're armed to the teeth and they shoot on sight. But O'Brien is near, and he has got to get to him, and it would seem that the science personnel on these little expeditions are the ones that call the shots, and O'Brien drifts away from his escort with little fanfare. Oh my, how convenient. O'Brien does not remember Deacon right off the bat. He's stuck in a panicked loop of repeating that Nero personnel may not engage with civilians. 
that for the second time in O'Brien's life, Deacon St. John controls him with a firearm, and somehow he talks O'Brien into calming down. All he wants is information. And it would seem that um, perhaps, just, just perhaps, maybe, Deacon was mistaken about his wife's fate. I, I can't promise anything, but I'll, I'll check. Uh huh. And I'm gonna go with you. No, you, you can't. Please, you don't. Hey, you don't understand. I'll fucking shoot you. Not before I shoot you. Okay, look. If you're gonna fucking kill me, do it. Okay. I did my job. Did the woman, your wife? I put her on oxygen. I gave her an IV. I kept her alive. I got in a lot of trouble for that. She was septic. She wasn't gonna make it. But I got out of the mass unit. I saved her goddamn life. It would also seem that perhaps I was mistaken about O'Brien's bravery and strength of character. Perhaps a new ally has appeared, an uneasy one given Deacon's abrasiveness. Once away from the scene, and not even back to his bike yet, Deacon is on the radio demanding that O'Brien answer him, like he doesn't know how to handle the emotion rising within himself, so it comes out as bursts of anger and demands. Though when telling Boozer, he's, he's insistent that he doesn't think or even hope that Sarah is alive, he just wants to know how she died. Speaking of, well, dying, Boozer. Still not calling a spade a spade. Sarah taught Deacon how to make a burn ointment from lavender a long time ago, but it's akin to putting a band-aid on a bullet wound. The duo are not ready to face the problem. And now, gosh dang it. Rippers hit the Hot Springs camp headed by Ada Tucker, and they took off with three of her slaves. I mean, prisoners. I mean, three of her valued community members. One of them just so happens to be the young Lisa Jackson. If Deacon needed an opportunity to blow off some steam, well, it has certainly presented itself. Go kill some cultists and save a teenage girl. Every anti-hero's wet dream, right? But Lisa has been marked by this excursion. They were already marking the girl up with their trademark scars, but even after getting her out, Lisa refuses to go back to Ada Tucker's mini-work prison. It was cruel there. So Deacon will do something that he probably swore that he would never do again. He gets in contact with someone from another camp, the Lost Lake Camp, headed by Iron Mike. And well, you know, Deacon kind of messed up with the Lost Lake Camp, specifically with Iron Mike. You see, about a year prior, Iron Mike found out that Deacon was delivering slave labor to Ada Tucker's camp, since Iron Mike wouldn't pay Deacon to bring in survivors. And we'll go into Iron Mike's story in a bit, but he is a pacifist and abhors what Ada Tucker is doing in her camp. Iron Mike and Deacon had a major fight when he found out, and Iron Mike threatened to break his neck if he ever saw him again. But the Lost Lake camp is probably the safest bet for Lisa, so Deacon gets in touch with an old pal named Ricky. And Ricky is pretty okay folk. She gives Deacon all the grief and backtalk that he deserves for being a real piece of work, but gently takes custody of Lisa. He'll tell Ada Tucker that Lisa died. The girl will at least be free of that particular hell, but who knows if she'll be able to find her place at Lost Lake. That's her own battle to fight, though. Deacon has other things to worry about, namely, Boozer, still. Deacon manages to make it back to their little safe tower for the night, just to rise to Boozer hallucinating and holding a loaded shotgun. He, he hears something coming up the steps and he doesn't recognize Deacon. It's really past time to acknowledge this problem. Deacon convinces Boozer to get on his bike, to just, to just go for a ride, to clear his head. But what he's doing is he's taking him back to a spot near Lost Lake. He intends to sneak his way into the camp and steal whatever medical supplies Boozer needs. It's not his worst of ideas, but Iron Mike will tan his hide if he sees him, if not outright snap him in half. You see, Iron Mike is one big dude. But Butterfinger Deacon, of course, he gets caught in the act by Ricky and her girlfriend Addie. Addie, who also happens to be the camp medic, and oversees the infirmary that Deacon is now stealing from. But Boozer has a history here too, possibly one not as dramatic and heated as Deacon. When his name and his status enters the confrontation, Addie commands Deacon to bring Boozer into the camp for treatment. Finally, someone with some gosh dang sense. Ricky goes to assess and assist with the situation and really points out just how ridiculous the biker boys have been with their lone wolf nonsense. 
Boozer looks about two steps from hell at this point. And thankfully, he doesn't have a lot of fight left in him to claim that he's fine. While Boozer gets his beauty treatment, Deegan needs to go face the music and have a talk with Iron Mike about why he's there and to confront what happened a year prior between them. And now we get to meet a beloved fixture of the camp, Schizo. Schizo is from California, and he was actually an academic achiever before the world toppled over. He dresses and acts like some 1990s sitcom gang member, though. He's, he's a peeping Tom, and he leverages his position as head of security over others in the camp. A real piece of work in the tapestry of this world. But this is really between Iron Mike and Deacon. And Iron Mike is probably the most rational of the camp leaders. His first inclination is not to pull a weapon on somebody or to pass judgment. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone and all that. Deacon just wants a few days and medication for Boozer and not some warm homecoming. Regardless of the effort and the cost, he will do whatever it takes, which Iron Mike graciously agrees to. Deacon actually apologizes for what he did. He takes responsibility and regrets taking people to Tucker and leaving Iron Mike the way that he did. Iron Mike does not hold any grudges over it either. Deacon brought Lisa here and has stopped running for Tucker, so that shows progress. Deke even tells him of their plans to move north once Boozer is better. In exchange for and in aid to Boozer's treatment, Deacon will do runs for Lost Lake Camp, specifically retrieving medical tools and supplies for Addie at the infirmary. No problem. And to make the events of the day even brighter, Lieutenant O'Brien finally contacts Deacon and requests a meeting after his supply runs for Addie. While O'Brien does wear a Nero suit, Saying that all Nero personnel are on the same team wouldn't really be accurate, it just kind of looks that way. O'Brien does not have a choice in what he is doing, and a bit like a young research intern David Gorman, Lieutenant O'Brien suspects that Nero is up to something with all this data that they're being forced to collect. So in exchange for O'Brien's help in finding information about Sarah, O'Brien wants Deacon to in turn help him, plant trackers on other Nero copters so he can see where they are going. There is a huge number of field missions taking place and no one knows what the other field team is doing. O'Brien wants to know what is happening and Deacon is going to help him. Sounds fair to me. And this first group that Deacon tracks, at least on surface level, they seem to be interested in the evolutionary differences developing between different types of freakers. They got their hands on a bleacher. The ones that are just a little bit more intelligent and physically dangerous than basic swarmers. But for now, this is just a piece of a much larger puzzle for O'Brien to piece together. Back at the Lost Lake camp, even with Deacon's scavenged supplies, Boozer is taking a bad turn. The infection is in his blood, and all they can really do is wait. The supplies are meager though, it won't be enough. But, you know, Schizo, he just so happens to know of a plane that went down when the outbreak happened. It has medical supplies, and really the only issue with it is that it's in Ripper territory. And Iron Mike has a truce with the leader of the Rippers, Carlos. They leave each other alone. Iron Mike was trying to negotiate some way of getting half of those medical supplies from the Rippers, but it was going slow. Going into Ripper territory would violate that truce, but, well, you know, just... Just don't get caught, right? Right? Schizo will take care of the border guards on their side, and the rest is up to Deacon. Just... Just don't get caught, buddy. Except Deacon absolutely does not make it through Ripper territory undetected so much for that sentiment. But good news. The plane did come down in a rather controlled manner, meaning it's not a mangled wreckage. The supplies inside are probably perfectly intact, except... Oh, buddy. There is a big boy here. A breaker type. Those are the evolutions stemming from people that were already built out or roided up. They'll attack anything, even other freaks. Ooh, yikes, he's a feisty one. Well, he was a feisty one. And so those crates of medical supplies that Iron Mike was trying to negotiate for are gone. All Deacon really finds is a small cooler of medication. Their leader, Carlos, has been yanking Iron Mike around while taking the supplies for themselves. Thankfully, good guy Schizo alerted Deacon to the airdrop in time for him to get some of those supplies. Except, oh my goodness, ugh. 
Ricky cues Deacon in that um, Schizo has been trying to push Iron Mike into conflict with the Rippers for months to wipe them out. Schizo doesn't like his passive approach to things that Schizo deems a threat and will undermine Iron Mike to get his way. It's just a real game of camp politics we got going on here already, huh? Though Deacon was mostly pretty successful in his medicine retrieval, it is way too late for Boozer, or at, oh, at least his arm, that baby. Oh, that baby needs to come off right away. Yeah, let's do this. Oh my, oh my god, okay, never mind. Oof, an amputation with no sedative and very little to aid in the process save the supplies that Deacon managed to scavenge up. But Addy is a cut above the rest and performs the amputation beautifully. Boozer makes it out alive. A few pounds lighter, but he's still alive, and that box of medication that Deacon got from that plane in Ripper territory is going to save a lot of lives. All things considered, it could have gone a lot worse. Iron Mike has some words for Deacon about his reckless behavior and writing checks with other men's blood, but he is a man of words, not violence. When Carlos comes for retribution, Iron Mike will do what he can to negotiate peace once again. O'Brien next sends Deacon to a Nero crew that he has already placed a tracker on, but he wants to know exactly what it is that they're doing. And this woman, Lieutenant Booth, is beginning to piece together the nature of the virus, that it was engineered, that it wants its victims to become what they are. Remember, each Nero field team is kept sequestered from each other. O'Brien is about to become extremely important, a central figure to the coming tale. And while O'Brien continues his search for the truth, Deacon and Iron Mike have what I assume to be an awkward moment of understanding and thankfulness for each other's work, and an expedition into the wilds. You see, O'Brien isn't the only one putting together information. Deacon got some wild ideas of his own, and Iron Mike is just the man to hear out these crazy ideas. You see, Oregon has such a massive freaker population because hordes are traveling up from California for colder weather. Californians, you know, speeding through school zones, not using their blinker, driving too close to other cars, rolling through stops, causing traffic jams, trashing public parks, and now they're sending their freaks up to Oregon. I know the truth. I know what you do, Californians. I've heard the stories, and you stop it. You stop it right now. You leave Oregon alone. But, social justice aside, how can the stem of thousands of freaks be stopped that are traveling the highways up from California? Well, the vast majority of freaks, with possibly exceptions to the young newts, go into cave systems in the day to escape the sun and the warmth. It doesn't harm them, but freaks tend to favor being nocturnal. The waste that they excrete has pheromones that act like a beacon to any other freaks that get separated from the main horde. They can wait until midday, and then they can blow these cave entrances, sealing thousands of freaks inside at a time. They will starve out. They need sustenance to survive. They're not going to die and get back up afterwards. Seal those freaks in the caves and it will kill them by the thousands. And then suddenly they won't have a place to sleep either. The hordes don't stay together as efficiently. They're easier to kill. The waste piles dry out. The groups don't cluster up anymore. An easier war to fight with no reinforcements coming up from the south anymore. But it's going to take a lot of dynamite to do this, and Iron Mike is just the man that Deacon needs to get that TNT. He knows the history of these cave systems, that they were mining tunnels for Cinnabar back in the early 1900s, and that TNT was a fixture in expanding those systems. Those old TNT storages should still be under lock and key within some of those mines, and copies of keys to access those lockboxes should be held at the old county courthouse at Sherman's Camp, a place that Iron Mike promised he would never return to. Before Lost Lake Camp was set up at the beginning of the crisis, Sherman's Camp was a refugee town set up by locals. Iron Mike was one of the inhabitants. Within two weeks, the survivors were turning on each other and split into two feuding factions. People began dying, not from freaks, but by trigger-happy fellow survivors. Once the ammo supposedly had run out, a meeting was called at the preschool for a truce. Except, the ammo wasn't actually gone. Peace talks were short-lived. A massacre took place in the preschool. Every inhabitant of Sherman's camp was killed, save Iron Mike and a woman named Nora. 
and this ugly, unnecessary, tragic event was the seal for why Iron Mike does not pursue violence in his dealings and negotiations. He's wrecked with survivor's guilt over what happened there. Not even the children were spared. A powerful lesson that Deacon struggles with. There must be a balance between mercy and action. But it's difficult for him to quantify, because because Iron Mike just must not actually want to seal the caves. He brought Deacon here just to teach him a lesson. It's hard for him to come to terms with. Freaks aren't going to be around forever. Now, when they're gone, we're going to need some folks around here to help pick up the pieces. Hey, look, hey, hey. I don't like Carlos and his rippers any more than I like Tucker or, or Copeland and his, his, his goddamn truthers. All right, but here, look, here's the thing, Deke. I'm not going out of my way to kill any of them. I've had my share of killing. When the freaks are gone, and one day they will be gone, they will need one another to rebuild. Boozer seems to be doing much better, just lord of the jokes and the ha-has, probably pretty stoked to not be dead. Deacon and Boozer used to ride together almost everywhere, but now it's just Deacon out there. Boozer's health is returning, but without an arm. How will he return to normalcy? Not only that, but... The Ripper presence is thickening, and under direction of their leader Carlos, they're actively hunting Deacon and Boozer, with directions to burn them if caught. Iron Mike has a fragile truce with the Rippers, but Deacon and Boozer's presence there could be problematic if Carlos finds out that they're at Lost Lake, couldn't it? Why oh why would Carlos be hunting specifically these two men? As Boozer starts to become more functional and is tasked with working around the Lost Lake camp, reality really starts to settle in. He becomes withdrawn, depressed, but unwilling to talk about what is troubling him. Deacon thinks that maybe bringing him his motorcycle will cheer him up. It's, it's a sweet gesture. A familiar item that's such a large part of Boozer's life, but Boozer can't ride it. They won't be going north, at least not together. Boozer can barely perform farm work, and this reality, it really sucks. Boozer is a drifter, not a farmhand. Addie catches on to this very quickly and asks Deacon to keep an eye on Boozer. Things are just going to become harder for him as his old life seems to slip away. The two stabilize one another, and Boozer is going to need support. Deacon has been spying on Nero teams for O'Brien, gathering intel for him. But things get exquisitely interesting near the old Camp Creek area up in the hills where it is snowing. It's exceptionally cold. A freaker subject has been under observation there, a stage 2 subject. But this freaker, its claws have been chewed down. They're more akin to fingernails. Its muscles are more relaxed. It's wearing jewelry and clothing that is less tattered and filthy than the other freaks. It put that jewelry on. It changed into those clothes. It took shelter in an old home like it was having moments of lucidity or having memories of the lives that it once lived. What made them human is gone. Nero has studied their brains enough to know that there's no coming back from what they've become. But in some of the freaks, bits and pieces still remain. But what it means for the future of the virus and those infected is still unclear. Ooh, spicy. There's plenty of man drama to be had back at Lost Lake between Schizo and Deacon. But Iron Mike knows where some TNT stores may be in a nearby old mine. Schizo is insistent that they've already lost men in or near that mine. It is an exceptionally dangerous place. But it's dark outside right now. The freaks will be out and about hunting, not sleeping in their caves. So now would be the best time to go in and see what became of the two lost men and find some of that TNT. I bet there will be absolutely no fighting or passive aggressiveness from either Schizo or Deacon towards each other. No sir, they're good communicators. The mine itself, of course, is pitch black. All they will have are some hellfire red flares to light their path through. Their best weapon in this case is just to be quiet. No shooting weapons, it could bring every freak still in the cave down on them. The TNT cache is completely empty at their first stop, meaning they'll have to go even deeper into the abyss. Oh, I hope no one is jumpy or claustrophobic.
They find their jackpot deeper into the mines. A small crate of TNT will be enough to seal several freaker nests and effectively turn the tides of this war humans have been fighting against them. And Deacon and Schizo, they get to have a lot of bonding time over how wrong Iron Mike is about his pacifism. And although from my perspective, it kind of looks more like Schizo is really just trying to make allies and some little coup that he has planned. Schizo wants to control the camp and he wants to usurp Iron Mike. He's not really shy about it. So much so that Iron Mike is well aware of Schizo's scheming, but he has faith that Schizo will see one day that Iron Mike is correct in his handling of other camps. Thankfully, Deacon really isn't the usurping type, especially not with a personality like Schizo. And on goes the eternal game of camp politics. Boozer, though, um, Boozer's gone. Yeah, he's gone on a bender. He's gone and he took a bottle of whiskey with him, a complete downward spiral into depression. Somehow, the oaf managed to get completely smashed and wander completely unharmed through wild territory from farm to farm and up roads without getting a gaggle of freaks bearing down on him. It's almost impressive, except it's, it's also utterly tragic for Boozer. He mutters about wanting to go home. Just home, sweet home, is calling to him. Deacon tracks him down near a horde, just walking out on the open road. But if Boozer is going to carry out his death wish, then he won't be able to shake off Deacon. It's just like the night that Joni died when Boozer tried to drink himself to death. Deacon will not let him do it alone. And if he wants to find his end at the hand of a bunch of freaks, then that will be both of their fates. But they're brothers, you know? What kind of a brother would sentence the other to death? So... Once again, one of the biker boys saves the other from their own self-destruction. They make it back to Lost Lake intact, but Boozer needs some hope. He needs something more than what he has festering in his brain. So, how about this? First things first, how about Boozer gets a little evil dead and that arm gets turned into a knife? I know, I know there's no chainsaws available, maybe some other time, but for now, a big old knife at the end of that limb. It's, it's kind of like giving a 10-year-old a new toy isn't it? I, I wonder what else they could attach to that thing. I mean, maybe Boozer will be able to operate some form of transportation in the future. Ricky is quite the engineer. Hell, maybe being able to change out that appendage could actually work out in his favor. Hmm. O'Brien is back on comms, telling Deacon that he needs one more favor from him and that he has something. Sarah Irene Whitaker's admission form to a Nero camp. He even knows her middle name. Of course, Deacon will jump at his request. Even if he acts like an ass over comms, Deacon has been waiting two years for this, and it's only fitting now that the healthy boozer comes with him. I mean, he can hold on to the bike, and he's literally got a weapon attached to him at all times now. It'll be fine. In fact, boozer will be an asset. The only downside is that he can't drive his own bike. It'll be fine, guy. Look at that smile. What a sweet boy. On this snooping adventure on behalf of O'Brien, Deacon learns that some of the freaks are starting to consume berries and plants. When game isn't available, they will consume whatever is. They're omnivores, just like us. Which means they're not going to naturally die out when they can't find animals or humans to consume. They're here for the long haul. They can forage and live off of the land. In exchange for all of this, O'Brien tells Deacon what happened to Sarah, at least up to a point. Sarah made it out of surgery. She was moved to a different camp on the outskirts of a place called Kemelt, but that camp was also overrun. The only people who made it out were Nero personnel, federal officials, and people with clearance. But the greatest odds would put Sarah as long dead. In the very least, O'Brien did everything that he could to keep Sarah alive, Beyond that night, there wasn't anything that he could do for her or anyone else left at those outposts that were overrun. O'Brien is just a researcher. And Deacon is able to finally thank him for his efforts and for saving Sarah that night. If he hadn't, at best, she would have died the next morning. Rippers have been pushing farther into Lost Lake territory, violating that little truce about staying away from each other's camps. Though in their defense, Deacon did kind of start it, didn't he? Carlos really has it out for him and Boozer, though. The Rippers are actively hunting them on enemy turf. So it's probably best for Boozer to stay within the Lost Lake walls, given the circumstances. 
but he is still struggling to adjust to his new life, and depression can be a demon. He needs something to keep him moving and motivated, a reason to stay functional. And it is actually Addy who has a solution. Boozer, you see, he kind of lost his cool when he saw a dog being harmed by rippers. And no, the solution isn't to give him a gaggle of rippers to take it out on. Get the man a puppy. Get Boozer a little creature to look out for. Give him a companion, a reason to get moving and something to look forward to. It takes Deacon some time and tracking, but he does happen to find a little fluff ball out in the boonies hiding in a shed. And you know, it's it's not a fix-all, of course. But it sure is nice to see a smile back on Boozer's face, isn't it? Boozer names the little beast Jack after the old leader of the Mongrels Club. It's one more step towards Boozer's life finding balance and purpose. Now, about that TNT. They don't have any detonation cord to actually set it off, and that is kind of an issue. But Schizo, oh so conveniently, just so happens to know of some place that they can get some, and it's right in the heart of Ripper territory. Deacon is of course unwilling to go into their territory because they're already on the cusp of conflict with the Rippers, but hey now, hey now, buddy, it's okay. Schizo is going to go with them, and he'll make sure that everything goes fine. He'll take care of everything. It's fine. Trust him, trust him, trust him. He knows a way into their territory anyways. No one will even know that they're there. Deacon, of course, agrees to this outrageously dangerous plan, probably out of desperation more than anything else. Camp wars aside, those caves need to be sealed. It seems to all be pretty simple, though. Extremely stupid, like playing baseball with a grenade, but it's really just a matter of not getting caught in their territory. The Rippers don't have super hearing or smelling or anything like that. In fact, they seem to be pretty caught up in their own weird bonfire rituals and screaming about getting low, whatever that means. If Schizo and Deacon act with care, then it should be fine. They even get to watch one of their weird little Ripper Freaker Pretend Time parades. I wonder if they're having fun with all that PCP in their systems, if this is, like, LARPing to them. And there actually is detonating cord in one of the old transportation buildings in Ripper territory. Schizo's intel was actually on point. It's exactly what they need, and maybe there is a friendship to be made here between Deacon and Schizo. Maybe cooler heads will prevail, and, you know, teamwork, a, a brighter future for, for Lost Lake Camp. What are you doing? Why is our love always betrayed? See, Schizo had dealings with Carlos recently, too. Iron Mike had asked Schizo to parlay with Carlos to retain peace between the two factions, a practice in negotiations for Schizo. It seems to have gone well, too, until Schizo learned that Carlos wanted Boozer and Deacon, and Schizo secretly agreed to give Carlos the two if peace could be maintained between the Rippers and Lost Lake. But why does Carlos want Deacon and Boozer so bad? Well, you may have pieced together the little hints as to why. The burning of tattoos with a blowtorch, specifically. Carlos was, in his former life, Jesse Williamson, that former mongrel member that killed a fellow biker. The same one that Deacon and Boozer held down as old Jack burned the tattoo off of his back with a blowtorch. Jesse went on to become Carlos preaching a sermon of forgetting the past, leaving behind pain, becoming more akin to the freaks than humans. Except Carlos, he never did that. He held on to his memories and his pain, as well as his vindictiveness. As soon as Deacon and Boozer appeared, he sent Rippers out to hunt them. A bit of a hypocrite, isn't he? And he wants revenge. Now that he has a chance at it, it's time for Deacon to receive some burns. Just a taste, though. This whole weird process won't begin in full until Boozer is present as well. The three of them together to finish this out. But some time ago, Lisa Jackson, that girl that Deacon found at Marion Forks, left Lost Lake Camp. She sought out the Rippers, wishing to forget her past and find a new identity. But seeing Deacon, who tried to befriend the girl and help her once, it's a reminder that she hasn't lost everything and everyone and she won't stand by and watch someone that showed concern for her be victimized when she can intervene. It's as simple as cutting Deacon loose and leaving him a weapon, but it's not as simple as just walking out of the room and returning to her duties. 
She is seen leaving the building that Deacon was in, and once he is loose, the Rippers know that Lisa was the one that freed him. But don't worry over our girl. She is plenty capable now. She will not return to a camp she's not meant for it. But she makes a clean break into the forest, away from the madness of the Rippers in a different direction from Deacon St. John. Ripper forces are already descending on Lost Lake to find Boozer. The trade of both Deacon and Boozer to Carlos was a part of the deal that Schizo made, and Carlos intends to collect. While fighting takes place at Lost Lake, Iron Mike and Carlos parlay at the heart of the camp. The fighting is called off after numerous casualties, but the negotiations are far from over. Deacon's unexpected return forces Schizo to confess to his involvement in this deal that he made with Carlos, something that did not have Iron Mike's blessing. And Iron Mike does not barter with people's lives. He doesn't start fights, but he has no qualm in ending them. Iron Mike will not give in to the demands of Carlos and the false keepings of Schizo. The terms of their truce will not change. There will be no exchange of life for peace, and Carlos's arrival with his rippers acts in violation of that truce. But if he takes his rippers and he leaves, the truce will stand. And Carlos, surprisingly, agrees. Iron Mike is the victor in this standoff, but Carlos will not give up on his desire to take Deacon and Boozer. Nor will Deacon allow Carlos to go in peace for very long. It has become far too personal now. Schizo is arrested, the dead are collected, repairs begin on damage, and Deacon and Boozer scheme. Deacon's father once taught him that the best way to get rid of a rat's nest was to drown it. So that's just what they're going to do. Deacon and Boozer collect some TNT and deck cord and ride back towards Ripper territory. They're going to blow a nearby dam and flood the valley floor where the Rippers live, drown the nest kill a huge number of people in the process, and then hunt down Carlos to ensure that he is dead. No more rippers, wash it all away. The final encounter between the two is just ugly and cruelly emotional. Carlos was never able to let go of what happened to him. He always held on to rage and indignation, always wished that he could take revenge. Knowing that Deacon and Boozer were still alive was just too much for him to pass up. They became his goal and his fixation. Even if it was in a past life, Deegan was a part of why Jesse turned into this creature. It's like putting down a wild animal now, attempting to end the cycle of pain and revenge that these two parties keep inflicting on one another. Hopefully this is it. The final mistake put to rest from Deegan's former life. The leader of the Rippers is dead and their home nest is destroyed. Hopefully this mess is something that is never allowed to happen again. Iron Mike, he understands why Deacon did what he did, but there were other choices that Deacon could have made that didn't involve such violence and death. Maybe if he just takes a hard stance against Deacon's impulsive risky behavior and disregard for life, then something will actually sink in. To counter Deacon's decision to stop another killing, Iron Mike chooses to let Schizo go. There was no fair trial to be had here for Schizo anyways, so Iron Mike had him sent away. A baffling decision to Deacon St. John. And sometimes there are things that take Deacon away into his memories of Sarah. Just, just little sparks that ignite events from the past. Memories that can torment someone who has lost so much or bring comfort in escape. Deacon leaves Iron Mike's lodge and he finds Addie having an argument with Ricky over learning to ride a motorcycle. And it takes him back to his time with Sarah, when she was just getting used to riding Deacon's bike. She was a natural at it. And he recalls one afternoon when he picked her up for a lunchtime right away from Cloverdale, just to get some fresh air. And, you know, didn't she once, didn't she once mention having clearance at Cloverdale? Yeah, it was, it was on her ID badge that she wasn't just some civilian, she was a PhD with, with some, some sort of clearance, right? The, Deacon gives O'Brien just a, a friendly, frantic call over the radio and, and asks just, just where personnel with clearance might have been taken to during the evacuation of the camp that Sarah was at, the, the one that was overrun. And it takes him a beat, but O'Brien, he actually finds Sarah's ID badge and he brings it to Deacon at another of their private meetings. 
Sarah Irene Whitaker didn't just have Cloverdale clearance. She had Class 4 federal clearance, meaning that even if she wasn't aware of it, she was kind of a big deal in the eyes of the federal government. Not only that, but good old O'Brien was able to use that information to discover that Sarah was taken out of the camp with a recon unit to a safe zone east of a place called Fort Rock. And that base is long since gone, but it was overrun by a militia group based out of Crater Lake, not freakers, human beings. Therefore, there is a chance that Sarah Irene Whitaker is still alive. And if she is, she'd be at that militia base at Crater Lake. And as if Lieutenant O'Brien doesn't already deserve a big ol' smooch, he also tells Deacon of the evolution of the Freakers. The ones that have survived this long are becoming more intelligent, stronger, more sturdy, far more dangerous to humans. Things are only going to continue to get worse, he fears. Thanks, O'Brien. You're not such a bad dude. Deacon needs help in reaching Crater Lake. There's only one way through the mountain pass, and Iron Mike is one of the few who knows how to get through it. Iron Mike agrees to help Deacon through, but only if Deacon agrees to not come back. If he gets through to the other side of the mountain, then he stays there. It's, it's not a threatening conversation, but Iron Mike, he seems to be firm on it. But it's an easy stipulation for Deacon to agree to. It's easy to understand for Boozer that he cannot take this trip. Not that he doesn't want to, but he can't ride on his own yet. The two need to part ways for, for just a while, though they'll still be in touch through radios when possible. Deacon has to take his own ride, out into unfamiliar places. Boozer will offer whatever encouragement and support he can. Hearing that there's even a possibility of Sarah being alive, well, it gets Boozer excited as well. He mourned her too in his own way. He wants Deacon to find that girl, even if he can't be there to help him. Iron Mike rides with Deacon as a guide up through the pass, through the rubble of old emergencies and tragedies, showing him not only the way out of the valley, but it's also the way back as well. This will take him to Diamond Lake, very close to Crater Lake, the place that O'Brien had mentioned, and perhaps there Deacon can begin his search. As luck would have it, before Deacon even reaches the valley floor, he runs into a couple of militia boys having some rager bear drama just the lead that he needs to get access to the camp that they're in. And the man there, called Captain Curry, that greets and initiates Deacon St. John, is wearing one of Deacon's old rings, a ring that he gave to Sarah on the night that he put her on that Nero chopper, heading out of farewell. Holy moly, Batman, this is it. The main camp of the militia is in a very ideal location, a place called Wizard Island in the middle of Crater Lake. The Freakers don't really swim, and the forest around the lake has been stripped out, making it impossible for anyone to sneak up on the camp. The camp is built up around and into a large cavernous hill. It's nearly the perfect fortress. Deacon and Captain Curry spend the day together tracking down a man, giving Deacon the opportunity to show what an asset he can be to the camp. He served in the military and has lived for two years in the wilds of Freaker country. This will get him deeper into the camp where he can find information related to that old Nero facility near Crater Lake. Closer to finding out information about Sarah, this is good. Corey and Deacon even share a moment talking about their lost spouses, sharing in the pain of it. Captain Corey is an unusually empathetic and observant man for these parts. He understands Deacon's loss. And Deacon's performance that day garters him a chance to be judged by this guy. The camp leader, Colonel Garrett. And Garrett is all fire and brimstones, like one of those evangelical preachers on TV who just will not shut up about righteous judgment and being the hand of God. He really likes to listen to himself grandstand and preach at folk. But Deacon doesn't have to like him. He just needs to get into the camp. He needs them to trust and accept him so that he can start snooping. Mentioning his time in the army, his honorable service, his handiness with a weapon gets Deacon immediately sworn in with the Deschutes County Militia. It's all going according to plan. Colonel Garrett is using the cave system on the island as something he calls the Ark, a collection of literature, art, seeds, dried plants, computer drives to be preserved should humanity fall. Not a bad idea. Actually, it's kind of cool. So maybe this place won't be so bad. At the heart of the camp are two important research areas, 
The first is headed by a man named Lieutenant James Weaver, a chemical engineer working on new ways to blow up and burn out freaker nests. Deacon will do runs for Lieutenant Weaver when asked. He will also need to do runs for another researcher. This one is a little bit less agreeable. But exactly who Deacon has been searching for all along. It would be tough to spend two years thinking that the love of your life was dead, just for them to waltz back in like this. Deacon has had time to process that Sarah could still be out there. But Sarah has had no such luck. She's been left to grieve Deacon alone for two years, with no hope of him ever being found alive after the hordes claimed everything. After the Crater Lake Nero facility was taken down, Sarah signed on with the invading militia to continue her work. She was trying to find a way to, to not just kill the virus, but maybe to cure those infected. She didn't dare tell anyone about her intentions to cure it and risk losing her research resources. Colonel Garrett allowed her experiments with the understanding that she would help kill the freaks, not cure them. Though she has been neglected during supply runs due to her difficult requests and cold demeanor towards others. But with Deacon here, well, maybe she can get what she needs. She will not leave the camp until she has found a cure or finalized a weapon against the virus. She can still do some good. She's so close to completion. Her relationship with Deacon will have to remain out of the spotlight so as not to alert anyone as to their relationship. Fraternization between genders is strictly forbidden, and if Colonel Garrett found out, then he would probably have them separated. And she needs Deacon's help more than his affections. So, things will just have to remain distant and rocky for now. Deacon performs supply runs in service to both James Weaver and Sarah Whitaker, though he tends to favor Sarah over James. The icy relations between Deacon and Sarah are a frequent point of contention. They just, they can't quite seem to communicate on the same level. Deacon is extremely impatient with the whole ordeal, and Sarah wants to see her work through to the end with no wiggle room to fit Deacon into her day. They even argue about her thanking him for his deliveries and him calling her ma'am. Marriage must be stressful. I'm exhausted just listening to it. Weaver makes some pretty awesome progress on his bombs, and though it goes against Sarah's intentions of saving lives, his burn-it-down approach will be effective against nests, and it will save the lives of humans trying to clear them out. If Weaver and Sarah's plans could be utilized together, perhaps even more lives could be saved. But with Weaver making such strides, it puts Sarah at risk for being shut down because she is not yielding the same results. So, more equipment is needed, more specialized supplies. Sarah even goes out on a run with Deacon to get a centrifuge from a local college. But the kind of equipment that Sarah really needs would be the sort of stuff from Cloverdale, her old lab. Stuff that's impossible to get out here, and well, I mean, as luck would have it, you know, Cloverdale, you know, it's, it's just up the mountains, near that path that Iron Mike took Deacon up. And, I mean, Deacon knows the way now. If, if Sarah's up for it, they could just ride out and check out Cloverdale. See if they can find anything of use if it's not completely overrun or destroyed. And for this idea and this escort, Deacon does hereby receive one smooch. It's a bit of a drive, but when they get there, well, holy moly, the building is still powered, the electric fence is still intact, crops are being watered by the automated system, the building is still locked down, the AI still responds to Sarah's handprint and her employee number. It's like, it's like Cloverdale was completely untouched by what happened, or it appears that way at first. There are a few old cars out front, with a few of Sarah's old co-workers inside. Bullet wounds in their clothing. They weren't killed by freaks. Someone shot them. Furthermore, the surveillance cameras are still working, and by the time they reach one of the building doors, Sarah is locked out. Someone is inside that building, someone who knows how to use the computer system. In fact, there are about seven men inside, headed by a piece of garbage rent-a-cop named Jim, who once pulled a gun on Deacon for riding up to the Cloverdale gates to pick up Sarah, the sort of man that should never be allowed to carry a firearm. Sarah and Deacon manage to corner them and to cut them down and to take Jim under control for questioning and to force him to override the AI lockdown that is keeping Sarah out of her old lab. 
in a testament to just how much Sarah has changed since Deegan first met her. Once that door is open, Sarah interrogates Jim, asking just what the hell happened to the people in front of the building. Why were they killed? And Jim's obvious answer was, well, they couldn't take the risk of letting them go. So Sarah will not take the risk of letting him go and executes him. Sarah never saw the inside of the lab once her access was revoked. When she worked there, they grew ginger and grape root and studied plant life. There were never mammal fetuses on site. The clean room was filled with old testing material unfamiliar to her. One of the sample storage cases was broken, the vapor tube disconnected. The work of David Gorman, patient zero. He must have just run in and grabbed it with no personal protective equipment. It's confirmation that Sarah and her colleagues' research was being used for manufacturing the virus, that David Gorman was correct about a weapon being created there. She had suspected it to be true for a long time, but seeing the overhauled lab, that was the nail in the coffin. This is where that virus was created. Yikes. Rough. Cloverdale now can serve as a new safe zone. It has electric fencing, unlimited power supplies, soil, gardens. So it's time to call Boozer. Let him know the good news about Sarah and Ricky to tell her about Cloverdale being prime for occupation. Good news all around. And Sarah got the DNA sequencer that she needed for her research. Oh, and they both got laid, but this is a family-friendly channel, so I can't show you that. With everything going so well, it would be really, really unfortunate if someone did something really st stupid, like it, like if a drug addict that Deacon met once at training murdered the only doctor in the region when he got caught stealing from the infirmary. Oh, 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 that's exactly what happened? Oh, oh, they gave a drug addict a job in the infirmary uh, around drugs? Oh, okay, so, so Dr. Jimenez is dead. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Wade Taylor, the drug addict, killed the doctor, stole all the narcotics, and made a run for it out of the camp. Now, Taylor is tracked down, and he is handled. This is a very tragic event, but the repercussions will carry farther than just the death of the doctor. Colonel Garrett was already an exceedingly paranoid man, but losing the only doctor in the region was a complete loss. He was absolutely irreplaceable. This is true, but this loss is going to push Garrett into making some highly irrational decisions very soon. But in the meantime, Sarah is getting ready to test her virus killer on a newt that she has been observing and running blood tests on for some time. And well, you know, it it certainly does yield some results, but it, it doesn't cure the girl. S sorry, the newt. It actually kind of internally liquefies her very quickly effective as a weapon, but certainly not as a cure, and it's highly upsetting for Sarah to admit that she failed in creating something that she so desperately wanted. Deacon returns to just making runs for the camp, even has a grand horde fighting adventure with the cool cat, Captain Curie. Deacon and Curie have had quite a lot of bonding time, and Curie has spotted Deacon and Sarah having smooches. Curie knows what's up, but he's not a snitch. Colonel Garrett, however, is the ultimate in buzzkills. To make sure what happened to Dr. Jimenez never happens again, every valued academic mind in the camp is moved up from the campgrounds into the Ark and put under constant watch to make sure that nothing happens to them. Garrett's messiah complex is becoming worse and he equates much of what is happening to biblical stories. And Sarah Irene Whitaker is suddenly a bit more open to the idea of getting the hell out of there. Colonel Garrett even sends Deacon out on a bounty to find a man who took a copy of his Bible. Good use of resources there, bud. But it's time for more O'Brien. He will help Deacon get Sarah out of the militia, but in return, O'Brien needs Deacon to track down a freak test subject that has wandered into militia territory. The team that went into a cave to collect a field biopsy never got back in contact, and one of them, a guy named Cooper, happens to be a very close friend of O'Brien and he's genuinely worried over his well-being, as is Cooper's wife. O'Brien fears that this team may be in trouble because he's been observing rapid evolution in the freaks. The kind of changes that take millions of years to achieve are happening over the course of a season. He has no idea what could actually be in that cave. He's observed no less than 12 forms of the freaks, and there's almost certainly more variants of the virus that haven't been found yet. 
what Deacon has seen really is just the tip of the iceberg. In that deep, dark cave with only crimson flare light to help him through, Deacon comes across every body of the Nero team that they lost contact with. Something tore them apart one by one. O'Brien's dear friend Cooper was mauled as well, but he has just enough life left in him to explain that a single freak called a Reacher did this to the entire team. Think of it as, as a basic swarmer, but with compact muscles, hunting instincts, tracking ability, extreme aggression. It is the most dangerous thing that Deacon has seen thus far. In exchange for this, O'Brien will extract Deacon and Sarah with a Nero helicopter when the call is made. Now, the situation with Colonel Garrett was already a little skeevy and weird. But so long as he's not hurting anyone with his manic biblical touting, it's fine, right? Except that's the key point, not hurting anyone. When that starts, well, things can become frightening, especially with religious fervor behind it. Some of the new recruits have been telling Garrett about other camps in the region, really just folks trying to mind their own business, who happen to be within reach of Crater Lake. And that would include camps on the other side of the mountain, like Copeland, Ada Tucker, and Iron Mike's Outpost. According to Colonel Garrett, they're full of degenerates, thieves, addicts, and murderers, and they must be purged from the world by their hands. They are a threat to the militia, and so he will send forth his army to baptize the world around them with fire. Oh good. Understandably, Deacon panics a little bit and calls O'Brien for the pickup. He's only got a few minutes to disable their anti-aircraft weaponry and collect Sarah from the Ark, which really isn't that difficult for Deacon. This isn't some wild and outrageous mission. In fact, everything goes extremely well, and the couple are able to make it to the extraction point very quickly. But of course, well, Garrett is there and he happens to have a couple of new recruits. Nothing is ever that easy, is it? And remember Iron Mike's little display of mercy for that rat-ass schizo? Well, that was probably a pretty bad idea on Iron Mike's behalf because schizo is here and starts shrieking like a harpy at Deacon's presence. He's an absolute snake in the grass and will do anything to get the upper hand in a social situation. And all of this means that when the Nerocopter arrives, their chances at escape are lost. Gosh dang it. And Colonel Garrett, being the absolute drama queen that he is, decides to initiate some religious court-martial for Deacon and Sarah within the Ark. Now is time for Schizo to really show his true colors. He sings like a canary any half-truth or blatant lie that he can muster to throw Deacon under the bus. After all, sniffing out a traitor on his first day would make him look really good, wouldn't it? Schizo will do anything to gain power and leverage over others, even play off of Colonel Garrett's obvious religious fervor. Schizo has seen Deacon's back tattoo of the mongrel emblem, a dead dog biting through chains. It wouldn't be hard to make it seem demonic to someone like Garrett. God, it's almost irritating how easy it is to play Colonel Garrett. When he does see Deacon's back tattoo, of course he thinks it's demonic and evil. That Deacon is demonic and evil, and the penalty for this is to be death, of course. Thankfully, Deacon convinces the Colonel that Sarah was really just his hostage and spares her any harm. But it is declared that in the morning, Deacon will be tried and hanged, although I don't quite see the point in a trial if he's already been determined guilty, but whatever, Colonel. I guess it's just an opportunity to grandstand and preach, right? But Garrett's inner circle isn't oblivious as to what is happening here. Colonel Garrett is going bonkers. Fear tactics may work on the common army grunt who just wants to be fed and sheltered, but not so much on the higher ups who have the full story. Namely, Captain Curry has an issue with all of this. Rather than deliver Deacon to a prison cell, Curry and a group of rebels get Deacon out of the camp. They are going to flee the madness that is about to begin, head east. I think that's actually a very good choice on their parts. It's unfortunate that they don't remain to help Deacon, but that is their choice to make. This small group has done enough already, and Captain Curry, thanks for being such a cool dude. Godspeed out there. Deacon has all the help he needs from the captain to get back into the fight. Schizo guides the militia back through the mountain pass to the Lost Lake camp where Iron Mike is. The camp is able to fight them off, but taking the camp wasn't the goal of the militia. This was taking down Iron Mike. 
No one is holding out hope on this one. There's no coming back from that wound. In his final moments, Iron Mike is able to speak with Addie and Ricky and Deacon, the people that will be the future of this camp. They will carry on his legacy, probably the closest thing that he's ever had to children. He doubts his choices in his final moments, but can rest knowing that the people in this room will do whatever they have to to keep the people in the camp safe. The loss of Iron Mike, it will be difficult to recover from for these people. He's been their protector since the camp was established. But for this valley to remain intact, there cannot be any time given to mourning, because that militia, they will be back, and there's no bartering for peace or calling a truce with these people. Now, Wizard Island, where, where the militia camp is, it is a fortress, but they put their armory and their garrison right next to each other at the main gate take those out, and the strength of the camp and the army crumbles just like that. But how even could they hope to get onto the island? How could they take out an armory and a garrison at the same time? Well, they'll just get a dump truck, they'll fill it up with fertilizer, get some creosote, and just make a big old dump truck bomb and drive it through that gate, rip out the guts of the army before the fighting even starts, then take out the colonel before liberating the people within the Ark that are not fighting. It's not just about saving Sarah anymore. This militia, it needs to be stopped, meaning the colonel needs to be stopped. It's not the most sound of plans, you know, making a truck bomb, but it definitely is a plan. So why not? Ricky is able to armor up and repair a truck that is well suited for the job and make Boozer a new arm attachment that will allow him to operate the truck. Our Booze Man is back in action. Oh, just. Just look at that smile. He gets to drive around a fertilizer bomb. Probably immensely exciting. When the truck is ready, a few key members from the Lost Lake camp immediately get ready to move out against the militia on the other side of the mountain. But because Deacon has been so involved in bounties and supply runs for the Copeland, Tucker, and Lost Lake camps, reinforcements from around the valley are sent to help in this fight, bolstering the numbers of the group significantly and uniting them against one massive encroaching threat. So maybe the lessons of Iron Mike made a difference after all. Everyone will be needed, regardless of their differences, to stand against what is to come. The attack takes place during the night, when there are fewer response groups readily available, when defenses would be lower. Boozer delivers that payload straight into the heart of the armory and the garrison, completely taking out the strength of the militia with one grand explosion. And don't worry, I am not going to play out dramatics. Boozer is just fine, don't you worry. All this fire and brimstone makes cover for Deacon to steal away into the Ark, and it doesn't take long to find Schizo, threatening James Weaver with a knife, demanding a detonator to blow the entrance to the cave so that they could be protected from what is outside. Weaver, though, absolutely does not want to be sealed in this place with these people and refuses to give Schizo what he wants. It's just the right opportunity for some shooty-shooty bang-bang against Deacon's old best bud. And holy moly, this guy never stops talking making excuses, trying to defend himself and blame others, squirm his way out of a fight. But he cannot worm his way out of this one. He has proven far too dangerous to the well-being of others. And Deacon, he is not above just taking revenge. Schizo does not leave these caves. He meets his end at the hands of Deacon St. John. And then Colonel Garrett. It's time for his finale, but it is not Deacon who will handle this situation. He could storm the room with guns blazing and bring violence against all within, but, well, Garrett has a gun pulled on Sarah. He can't really do that here, and besides, he may not realize it, but Sarah already has this situation completely under control. She put Hemlock into the Colonel's tea. All Deacon needs to do is not completely ruin the situation by running his mouth, which he almost actually messes up. But, geez, thank goodness he contained himself for just long enough for that poison to take effect. That was, uh, that was actually a close one, bud. Oh, the threat is over. But who knows if this camp cooperation will continue. 
At least for now, the Crater Lake camp on Wizard Island will have new leadership with people like James Weaver around. It won't be a militia anymore. Things are going to change. But it is a good foundation for a new camp, minus the religious military nonsense. New allies for Lost Lake just across the mountain. The Cloverdale research site will act as a new place for Sarah to carry on her attempts at a cure for the virus and a safe zone for people to call home. There are still caves to be sealed, to contain the freaks, but, you know, at least there are plans in motion to save this place. It will take time and cooperation, but, I mean, not like anyone has any other important plans to get in the way, right? What are, what are they going to do, start a bingo hall? No, it will just take time. And then, there's also the uncertainty of the Freakers evolving. After the hullabaloo at the Crater Lake fighting dies down and relative normalcy returns to the area, Deacon gets a radio call. From our old bud, O'Brien. It's been a while since Deacon has heard from him. I wonder what discoveries he's made in the meantime. How he's been doing. It's time for the last meeting between these two cohorts. O'Brien has something very important to tell Deacon. Imagine if the virus didn't attack the parts of the brain that make us human. All the effects that make the freaks superior threats, but none of the downside. O'Brien has been in that suit since the beginning. But when was he actually infected by Nero? Well, it's impossible to say. Perhaps his interest in these field studies and the evolution of the freaks was a self-interest. Perhaps the higher-ups found out about his dealings with Deacon St. John and volunteered him as a test subject. It doesn't really matter. O'Brien himself is a warning to Deacon about what is coming. A new stage in evolution.